Hi, good evening. Welcome all to the second episode of our De Gruyter Corona Talks. Today with uh, Tua Sursu from the Free University Berlin. Tua holds a um, master's degree in Latin and Greek from the University of Copenhagen. And he works on Cicero and Stoic philosophy as a doctoral student at the research training group Philosophy, Science and the Sciences in Berlin. And today he will tell us a little bit about Stoicism in his talk, A Crisis of Value, Stoic Responses to the Pandemic. So uh, thanks so much for being here, Tuil, and um, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ravi, and thank you for the, giving me the opportunity to talk in this wonderful series. Um, so as you already mentioned, I'll be talking a bit about the Stoics. Um, and I'll just start by giving a, a short recap of who they were for those who are not familiar with this school of thought uh, already. And then I'll go into their ethics, which will be our main concern today. Uh, so the ancient Stoics were, part, they were active in ancient Greece and Rome. Um, it was a, a philosophical school, that is an institution where you could go to learn philosophy, but also just hear lectures and where they would discuss and write uh, philosophical works in cooperation or alone. And the history of this school spans most of what we think of as antiquity, about 500 years from the third century uh, with the founder Sino to the uh, BCE, third century BCE to the second century CE uh, with Marcus Aurelius as the last major proponent of this uh, philosophical direction. Um, it's a quite diverse tradition, obviously, given that it existed for over 500 years, uh, but it, uh, it is characterized by something like a doctrinal core, that is some shared views uh, that mark you out as a Stoic philosopher, as opposed to different directions like a Platonist or Aristotelian uh, philosopher. And one of the major figures responsible for establishing this core of Stoic ideas is Chrysippus, uh, and it's his thought that I will be uh, most concerned with here. He lived in, from 280 to 206 BCE and was the third head of the school. So he led the school, he was its, so to say, director uh, for a, a good many years. And he was immensely productive, wrote a lot of books, uh, which were copied all through antiquity, but have sadly all been lost to us. Uh, so speaking about the views of Chrysippus is, is rather tricky. Um, and what I will present is my reconstruction of his thoughts, but of course, based on the works of countless other schol uh, scholars. Um, and this tra uh, tradition, it emerged in, in ancient Athens, but it spread all over the Mediterranean world. Uh, and we know that it appealed to a great many quite prominent Romans in, in particular. Uh, so we know that Cicero engaged uh, quite intensively with this line of thought, uh, but also Cato the Younger, Seneca, who was an advisor to uh, Emperor Nero, and as I already mentioned, uh, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and they all uh, testify to the fact that they found consolation and inspiration for their own lives in this uh, tradition. And just like these uh, great men of the past, uh, I will be arguing that, that we can learn something from the Stoics as well. Uh, so what is it about Stoicism that's inspiring? Um, what they were most famous for were their claims about what makes a human being happy, uh, how we achieve happiness. Um, and they were almost infamous for their view on this. Uh, so they claim that the only thing that matters for being happy is not what happens to you or what you're given here in life. So for instance, your status or your job, your wealth, uh, your health, uh, but all that is indifferent according to the Stoics. What really matters and what determines your well-being as a human being is how you react and how you deal with the things that you are given in life. Uh, this is what they call virtue when you do this right. Uh, so for them, virtue is 
a mixture of dispositions and ways of thinking that make you able to react correctly to any given situation, to always do the right thing, so to say. And to make things worse, they claimed that not only are the things that we have in life indifferent, virtue is also almost impossible to achieve. What most of us have are in fact emotions. And this was their term for things that, reactions that are false, uh, that are somehow non, not conducive to our well-being. Um, so for them, the goal of life, so to say, was to try to eliminate these emotions and come as far towards virtue as possible, uh, achieving the right, uh, the right uh, uh, attitude to life. They illustrated these ideas with some quite striking examples. Uh, so for instance, they would compare the spilling of a good glass of wine to you losing a child, arguing that the two things are in principle just the same. You need to take the same attitude towards these two situations, namely that the situation as such is out of your control as far as long as you have taken care to avoid this obviously in the one case quite disastrous outcome and um, you cannot be held responsible because that's just how life is sometimes your children get sick and sometimes they will even die from that yeah. and you can do things to prevent that and you should according to the stoics do everything you can um, but in the end it might be out of your hands and what matters is how you reacted to the situation of your child becoming sick and in the end of your child dying. And the same is true of spilling a good glass of wine. You should try to balance on your way, moving through the room with the glass in your hand. But if you stumble and spill the wine, you shouldn't waste your energy on, on being upset about that. Yeah, so this is obviously quite outrageous to most, and it was felt to be outrageous by the Stoics' uh, contemporaries as well. But they do have quite good philosophical reasons for claiming that it's the reactions, not the events that matter. Um, and those reasons are this distinction, quite strict distinctions between the things that happen to us and the things that are up to us. Um, and as I already mentioned, they they in the end claim that the only thing that we are responsible for are what we, how we react to things because there are so many things that are out of our power. I think that's a, a situation that most of us can sort of identify with under these pandemic uh, circumstances. Uh, there have been a lot of force majeure uh, and most of us have had to adjust in, in different ways to completely new and often quite unpleasant uh, changes in our everyday life. Um, and the Stoics, I think, give some degree of comfort in introducing this introduction. I think that's a, a helpful perspective, at least it has been for me during this, this crisis and lockdown, uh, to sort of push away some of the responsibility for the situation you're in, uh, to recognize that you're in a, a situation that you don't like, but also to recognize that it's out of your power, but what you can, what you can control is what you do with this situation. Uh, and you can try to, to make the best of it. Um, that's a relief, I think, but, you, but according to the Stoics, it's, almost, it's also still uh, an almost insurmountable task to actually attain this control of your reactions uh, to the degree that you will actually be happy. Um, and the reason for this is their analysis of how we act. And this is where I think the stories become most interesting uh, from a, a contemporary perspective. Um, so their analysis of, of how we, we act and how we, are, uh, how we become moral, uh, how we, we do the right thing in everyday life is not so much based on the, the individual choices that we are faced with. Uh, so we're often used to thinking about morality as a deliberation between two alternatives. And what matters is the choice you make in the situation. And, and what they claim is that very often, we're not really 
going through such deliberations. In the, the, the majority of cases, what happens is that we react more or less automatically on the basis of how we experience the situation. And what determines our experience of a given situation are our underlying beliefs and desires. And so if we really wanna change and if we want to, to be happy, uh, what we need to do is to critically revise our convictions, most importantly about our values, uh, what really matters to us uh, and why do we attribute such value to these things? Those are the, the uh, decisive questions and moral questions in Stoicism. Um, and so the, the goal of, of life in a way becomes to try to change the ingrained thought patterns that, that determine our, our behavior in everyday life. And the big prize the Stoics offers if we, are, if we are successful in doing this is happiness. So you, there's quite a lot to gain by becoming a Stoic uh, if they're right on this. Um, and as I said, I think, I think they're on to something. It's a, it's a quite plausible analysis of, of moral choice, I think. But on the other hand, there's all, there are also some severe limitations uh, or at least weaknesses to this, to this view. Uh, first of all, this promise of happiness depends on us accepting the idea that we can actually control our reactions in every single instance. Even though that's not our everyday experience and the Stoics don't claim that, they claim that we are all unable to uh, successfully control our reactions, but still they do think that in principle, it's humanly possible. Um, and that I think is quite a, a daring hypothesis. Uh, so the reason for this is that they say, well, it's, it's our thoughts that decide it. So you're in charge of what you think and therefore you can change it. But on the other hand, I think most of us would agree that we're not always completely in charge of what we think. Sometimes thoughts just pop up. Uh, we have emotional responses. We have instincts that we go by and the Stoics go some way in, in, in they have names for these phenomena and they recognize their existence, but they think that they are all basically uh, changeable. We can, we can modify them in ways that can ensure our happiness. And that I think is not necessarily completely convincing. Um, what is worse, I think, is are the possible consequences of adopting this attitude. So as I said, I find great personal comfort in this distinction between what is up to me and what is not up to me, uh, what I am responsible for in life and this focus on my reactions instead of the events uh, that happen in my life. But the, the danger of this, this idea is that it, do, it does promise, promise me full control over my happiness, but it also gives me the full responsibility. Uh, so there's no one else to blame if you're unhappy. Um, and I think that view can be turned into a quiet nasty attitude, especially when you start applying this to others as well. Um, of course, you can recognize that they might have reasons for why they're acting in, in ways that are not okay. But um, in the end, as a Stoic, I think you're, you have to bite the bullet and say that they're wrong uh, for reacting and that it's their own fault, no matter what their background was, because they have the chance to change it on the Stoic view. And again, I'm not completely convinced that that, that is plausible. Um, I think there, there are things that are out of our control um, and many of the Stoics critics, ancient critics thought so as well. Um, and a further possible uh, um, yeah, result of, of adopting this, Sto this Stoic view is that you might become somewhat indifferent to the real suffering and hardship that you witness here in life. Uh, because it's a core doctrine of Stoicism that all these things are 
indifferent to our happiness. So why do people get so upset when they are suffering from hunger or disease uh, in, the, in the present moment? Um, this, I think, is, is actually maybe the most problematic part of Stoicism, especially because it was a philosophical direction that was developed by very privileged men, uh, mainly. They preached the universality of humanity, so they, act they were actually quite progressive in acknowledging that all humans were equal, uh, including women and slaves, which was not at all a given in their society. But on the other hand, um, I think it is just so much more easy to adopt this attitude towards suffering when you're lying in a big villa at the Bay of Naples, uh, sipping wine, than when you're suffering uh, every single day trying to, to survive. Um, so those are, in my view, some of the, the limitations of Stoicism. But nonetheless, I would claim that we can actually profit from taking a Stoic view on our life situations in this crisis and not least on the, the situation of our societies um, at present. Um, so I think you can reasonably claim that the Stoic, um, that the, the present crisis has produced a, a sort of awareness that the Stoics would very much welcome, namely a sort of change of focus uh, to some degree from what we might call everyday politics and the everyday moral choices to a more, a deeper reflection about the values that inform our policies. Um, of course, many of the movements that are political movements happening right now are immensely complex and they rely on a number of, of conditions. But one shaping condition I think has been the way that COVID-19 uh, has just exposed the deep, deep inequalities in many of our societies and in, in the global uh, sphere in general. And I have been sort of happy as a, a quasi-Stoic to see that the response in many media and um, also online discussions has been a sort of questioning of what is this actually okay? Is this the society that we want? Uh, and that I think is basically the point of stoicism that you have to lift your eyes some, uh, from, from the everyday circumstances and try to see the values that, that determine our actions, both as individuals and as, as societies. Um, so that was, I'm hoping that, that that can be helpful for someone else as well. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Shula. That was uh, fascinating. I learned so much just listening to you. Um, and I'm saying that despite the fact that I read your essay and comfort too. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but thank you. Um, and um, of course, the, the question of, um, is this the world we want to live in um, is a big one. And I want to come back to that later and but maybe start up with, with a different set of questions, if you don't mind. So, um, and please correct me if I get anything wrong. Uh, stoicism is about the difference between the things we can change and the things we can't change, right? So what we cannot change, like uh, wars, presidencies, natural disasters, things like that, we just accept and make peace with it, however best we can, which on the one hand, you already mentioned it, um, is kind of making us, well, leaving us in a, in a very helpless situation. Um, and on the other hand, it's an excuse to not do anything, to mm -hmm. just give up uh, and leave everything like it is. So um, is that in essence uh, correct? I think it's a fair objection. I, I, I don't think the Stoics would agree. And I think they have good reasons for not agreeing. They would say that although uh, everything is out of our hands, basically, <laughs> that happened to us. Um, they, the human nature just doesn't allow us to do nothing. Uh, it's in our nature to react. Um, and that is also part of sort of, so they would, they would 
in stoic terms, they would say that what determines what happens to us is fate um, or nature as a whole, the universe as a, as a sort of completely coherent unity uh, or organism even. And we are part of that organism. Um, so despite a lot of what happens in the universe being out of our control, our being in the world is part of this overall plan. And because it's part of that, our nature is also sort of determined for participating in that plan. So just drawing back and doing nothing, of course you can decide to do, but that do so. But that would be in stoic terms to go against nature. And that is actually how they formulate the, the goal that you should follow nature or be in agreement with nature. So the consequence of just drawing back and doing nothing in stoic, on the, on the stoic view would be your complete unhappiness. Um, and I think, I think there is, there's something, I think it's a, it's a reasonable response that, yeah, um, of course, the fact that a lot of, of things happen to us might make you wanna, wanna just give up, but that's just not how most of us react if you look at it. There are so many people who live under such difficult circumstances that you couldn't blame them if they just rolled over and said, I can't stand this anymore. But nonetheless, so many people fight their ways through hardship. And I think that is sort of, that's the, the evidence that the Stoics would quote on this and say, well, might be a possibility, but just not for a human being as human beings are normally, normally function. And um, so in that sense, I, I think it's, they have, they have good reasons to reject it and they would very, they, they are very clear that this is not a consequence of their doctrine of fate, that you should just do nothing because fate requires you and actually forces you in this sense by creating us in a way where we can't just let go. It forces us to, to participate um, and to deal with the situations that we are faced with. I think that's, that's a quite, um, that, that creates, I think a sense of, that can create a sense of pride even in, in your dealing with hardship. Uh, so I think that can be quite motivating in the, yeah, in that sense, helpful uh, mm -hmm. in a human life. So, and because you, you also mentioned privilege and, and different, so it's, like you said, it's easy to be indifferent when bad things really happen to other people, mm -hmm. right? It's, yeah. yeah um, I think that, so, that might be where the real danger is, is hiding and that, that you might feel sort of excused in, in just accepting the suffering of others. And I think that that is a much fairer <laughs> uh, objection to stoicism. So for instance, I mean, Seneca clearly had slaves uh, and did nothing to change that, even though he quite clearly distanced himself from the view that pe there can be people that deserve to be slaves. Um, so he distanced himself from slavery, but he does absolutely nothing as far as we can, we can tell to, to work against slavery. And for all we can, we, we know Marcus Aurelius wrote his meditations about the universality of human community and, and sense of, of connectedness on the same days that he ordered massacres of German villages uh, because he was on a campaign. And he justified that, I guess, uh, with a reference to his, his role in life being that of a Roman emperor. And that's what emperors are there to do, expand the borders mm -hmm. uh, of the empire and defend them. But I mean, you might, you might wish for a more, <laughs> um, a more caring uh, attitude towards the, the mm -hmm. suffering of others. I think that's mm -hmm. fair to say. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, moral is maybe the word, the, the key to that, because um, how, I mean, how do you morally justify being indifferent when people around you suffer? Um, and if this is about values, isn't solidarity a value too? Mm -hmm. 
So very shouldn't much so, and a very central Stoic value. So they wouldn't claim that it's okay to be indifferent. Um, they would, they would quite fiercely oppose that idea, um, and they they actually they. That's one of the, the most fascinating strands in their thought, I think. Their way of, of looking at human community uh, and sense of solidarity um, as an inbuilt part of human nature and something that you cannot resist without losing your own chances of happiness. Uh, so they give, yeah, they, in that sense, they give a strong defense of, of acting in, in solidary ways. Um, so what I what I meant by my examples with Seneca and, and Aurelius was that looking at it from a 21st century perspective, you might get the feeling that there's some hypocrisy hiding there. But I think they would they would be happy to have you call that out, and they would agree if they were here <laughs> in the 21st century to see it with those eyes. But I also think they would sort of say, but that was also part of society at that time. And you have a, a duty to, to act in a solidary way and act morally in every situation, but you don't have to have a duty to change the entire world because that's out of your power. You can't do so. You can try to affect change by being a decent person, but, but it only goes that far. Mm. Whatever decent means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, so and, yeah no, sorry yeah and 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 that's where they where human nature comes in for them uh, so mm -hmm. they are quite confident in a way that is many in, in many ways foreign to us to just say well it's part of human nature so it's right <laughs> um and they try to give they they actually give quite detailed empirical evidence for their claims about what is part of human nature, but they have absolutely no scruples saying that is part of human nature, so that is right. For instance, this uh, thing we talked about being solid, uh, showing solidarity towards your mm -hmm. fellow human beings. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the ultimate goal you mentioned is um, controlling our emotions as best as we can. Um, how does one do that? How does emotion control work? Yeah, <laughs> that is a really good question and a real puzzle in, in Stoic studies as well. Um, something that um, scholars are, dis are debating still. Um, and I have only limited um, understanding of, of all these questions in stoicism. And um, so the basic, the, the, the overall goal as they formulated is technically to, to live in agreement with nature. And this in the negative uh, version becomes getting rid of your emotions because emotions by definition in stoicism are impulses or like reactions that go against na nature. Um, and I think their analysis of this is quite fascinating as I read it. Um, it, it centers on our conceptions um, on, of value. Uh, so their claim is that what, what you need to do in order to control your emotions is to change the way you see the world basically. And you do that by critically examining your assumptions about what has value for you as a person. Um, and that is an ongoing process in, in, in Stoicism and a very practical process because the only way you can change these judgments is by continually having new experiences that come closer to the right experience. Um, so only by actually engaging in moral actions can you become moral. You learn it by doing it, so to say. Uh, you change your conceptions of values because these are really, in Stoic term, in, in this, on the Stoic view, they are really physically part of your mind. Uh, your mind is made up of this stuff called pneuma uh, in Stoicism, which is sort of a fiery air, they describe it like that. 
And it's the tension, this pneuma that determines your mental condition. Um, and these conceptions are little alterations in this, in, this, uh, in this tension. And what you need in order to change your, your values, therefore, is to change this sort of, you need to, to adjust the, the, the alterations in, the, in your mind. And you can only do that by, by amassing new experience and new thoughts uh, that come closer to the right thoughts uh, as the Stoic uh, mm -hmm. see that. Uh, so it, in that sense, they, and, and I think that's the light that we should read uh, later Stoic writings in as well, that give very sort of hands-on um, guidance for how to change, get rid of your emotions uh, through practical everyday uh, sort of uh, exercises, uh, thinking about things in new ways when you see it. Uh, one particularly striking example is Marcus Aurelius, uh, who, who recommends that you go to the bedroom of your kids and uh, whisper in their ears, you're gonna die uh, when they sleep in order to adjust yourself to the thought that your children might die. And the man lost about five kids out of 13. So he knew what he was talking about. Um, and I, I don't think, I, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily, but, but I, I do like this sort of very practical approach to moral change and progress. Uh, that it's, it's really not about, it's, it's also about, of course, understanding Stoic philosophy and reading philosophy. Um, but you need to internalize these ideas that are encapsulated in the Stoic writings. And it doesn't really matter how you, you, go, you, do, you go around doing that, as long as you, you, you reach the right values in the end. You can do so through philosophical reading and, and sort of, yeah, uh, reflection, but that alone will never get you there. You need mm -hmm. to engage in life and really sort of live these values in order to change these ingrained thought patterns that all of us are fighting with uh, and that direct our re reactions in the wrong directions. So what you're saying is basically values are highly subjective when everyone comes up with their own set of values and acts according to them. I don't think they would, they're not subjective in the sense that anything goes, uh, that, that every, every person have different values in a sense because they are different people uh, being born under different circumstances. But a striking feature about Stoic philosophy is that they are very, they're adamant that there is an objective right way of being a human being. Uh, and that means there are right values as well. So values are objective uh, in Stoic philosophy in the sense that the, the end point of an ideal human development will always end up with the, the same values because these are the values dictated by nature for a human being. But uh, the starting point that we have. Some of that is objective as well in the, in the sense of shared by every member of the human species. Uh, but this objective core, so to say, is almost immediately uh, perverted, as they say it, by external influences and especially uh, social um, mm -hmm. conditioning. Uh, and that makes all of us sort of have subjective values that are wrong because they don't line up with the objective uh, goal of, of human life. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So, but um, I'm having trouble um, understanding how controlling emotions or, yeah, or being indifferent is uh, considered less important than emotions because even even the Greeks knew um, that um, change um, well that that only people with very emotional and passionate visions and views be they be they good or bad have ever changed things in society mm -hmm. um, and coming back to 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 our times now and you already mentioned that in your talk as well is that 
not a good time to to apply that. I mean, it's emotions that make people want to rise up. It's anger that leads them to go um, out on the streets um, and question authority, rightfully question authority. So isn't that uh, a good thing? I think the... In essence, the Stoics would agree, but they would say that calling that emotions is uh, just a, a confusion of terms. Uh, that that is getting the human psyche wrong. It's, it's actually one of the objection, one of the most important objections that they face, because as you mentioned, the, their contemporaries had a, a completely many of their contemporaries had a, a radically different uh, analysis of the human psyche, namely that we have these non-rational emotions, uh, for instance, anger, and that they are, they are actually, they actually play a, a key role in motivating us to acting also in moral ways. But the Stoics would, would claim that the, the part of that experience that's actually motivating you to act is not an emotion at all. It shouldn't be called an emotion. Uh, it's, it's you reacting to the situation. Uh, and that reaction is always filtered through your rational mind. The moment you, you become rational, so in, in the Stoic view, you're not rational when you're born, but you become rational in time. And the moment you become rational, your reactions will always be shaped by your rational capacities. And that is what promises you the, the control over your, your reactions, the complete control of your reactions. But it also means that on the stoic analysis, you can't accept the idea that anger is a good thing because anger is when, when you let yourself be overwhelmed by your reaction, your immediate reaction. So when reason is not able to when your reason is not able to to control this impulse to sort of flare up and, and yeah uh, and react in, in violent way, ways so they would only talk of of anger and an emotion in the cases where this is excessive or misguided and so they would go along actually with the, the essence of your idea and say our reactions we we are made in, in ways that make us react to injustice. And that is good. That is how nature intended us to be. Uh, but we are also made in ways that allow us to, to exert rational control over these reactions and shape them in, in ways that are conducive, both to our own well-being and the well-being of our communities and societies and humanity as a whole. Uh, and it's only when the, your reaction is not conducive to those ends that they would say that you're having an emotion. So they would simply, they would simply claim that, that you're right, but you're using the wrong words to describe the phenomenon. I heard that one before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so when values are constantly changing and Basically, people make up new ones all the time, depending on their culture, society, education, wealth, skin color, you name it. Um, would you say there are still stoic values applicable today? I think very much so. I think this, this basic focus on decency, in a way, they, they, or doing the appropriate, doing the right thing, uh, being a decent person, I think that's very that's a, a very appealing uh, notion, uh, and I think it's it's especially appealing because they give the analysis that I've presented of of this being a matter of you learning to control your reactions, um, so you don't judge people by by the outcome of their actions, but more of how they reacted to the situation mm -hmm. that they were in. Um, I think that's a that's a a core value of stoicism that I very much agree with. Uh, and there are several very appealing 
uh, thoughts in, in values in, in stoicism, then I think we could we could re that are becoming more and more relevant uh, also through this pandemic. So we already mentioned the, their views on human community uh, and the universality of, of human nature. I think that's in, in the context of the whole Black Lives Matters movement is an extremely appealing sort of um, a way of, of recognizing the common ground that connects us as humans. And so they're, they were probably the first in, in the Greek, uh, in the Western tradition to, to really spell out uh, the idea that every human is equal by nature. And that that means that none of the distinctions that our societies rely on are justified um, by nature. Uh, they're justified by being part of the society that happens to exist at that point. Um, but they're open to change because it's not part of, of human nature that you must be a slave. And this is at a time when Aristotle will speak, would speak of natural slaves. Um, and everybody would assume that women were incapable of taking care of themselves. Um, or acting decently. Uh, so they were quite progressive there. And I think that's a, that's a thought that you can definitely uh, take with you from the Stoics uh, in, in a modern context as well. Um, and I, I do like also the idea that in times where we are becoming more and more aware of the deep inequalities that our society still perpetuate on the basis of skin color, uh, gender, um, all kind of social background, all these contingent phenomena um, that you try to, as a person, but also as a society, to focus on the, the core, the core that makes us all human. Um, and they have a very appealing analysis of that, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice, nice way to put it. Um, okay, um, I think it's it's now time for us to look at the questions um, mm -hmm. in the audience, and I just read them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one um, is um, the Stoic philosopher Epictetus mm -hmm. said, "We can only control our thoughts and our actions." Do you think the pandemic will change this outlook, considering its social, physical, and uh, psychological impacts. Um, so, if I understand the question correctly, it is whether the pandemic will rule uh, will prove Epictetus wrong in a sense. Um, I I don't think so, uh, actually. Um, so, I already aired my own doubts about whether Epictetus is really right. Um, I I think it does rely on sort of a, a reduction of the human psyche uh, in, in only allowing rational thought processes a role in, in guiding our behavior and our, yeah, our mental lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the crisis will, will definitely, it has at least personally for me, raised my awareness of, of this, these other factors of <laughs> uh, in your in in what shapes your life, um, but in a sense, I think the crisis more than it proves Epictetus wrong. I think it actually proves the Stoics right, at least as I understand them. In in the sense that one thing that they stress very much is that there's a huge gap between our sort of the, the thoughts that we might entertain uh, consciously and our actually re actual reactions uh, to situations. Um, and at least that's been, been an experience for me in, in lockdown, this sort of, I'm, I have been extremely lucky as a person. I have 
I am privileged in any way in this situation. My income is secure, at least for the next year or so, as is normal in academia. Um, my wife's income is, is stable. Our kids are he healthy and happy. We have a relatively big apartment. I mean, I have nothing to complain about. And nonetheless, I found myself complaining all the time. <laughs> <laughs> at least in periods during the lockdown um, and this distress sort of that I think a lot of people have experienced regardless of whether their situation was actually sort of objectively bad um, I think that sort of proves that the strength of the stoic analysis that well you can tell yourself that you have absolutely nothing to complain about but the fact is, if, if your ingrained thought patterns is that meeting your friends is something really valuable, you can't just make that go away by telling yourself that you can, you can do without that for a couple of months. It's not that bad because you'll actually miss it. Um, and I think that's what Epictetus uh, basically meant about us having control over our thoughts and actions. Mm -hmm. is that we it's not that we can control it in this very direct way of just telling ourselves that's wrong so i won't feel that anymore but in the more profound way of saying we can actually change if we recognize that some of the, the thought patterns that we have create distress we can change them because they are all thought patterns and we have the power to change that mm -hmm. at least to some degree I think, I think that's true. And I, I think sort of realizing that during the pandemic made it easier for me to change the, the, some of the, the thought patterns and, and reduce the distress that I felt during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, next question. Does not Stoicism, at least in most of the Stoic writings, propagate a sense of indifference which can easily slip into a rather destructive attitude towards death? I, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think it, it does. I uh, personally, I, I have a really hard time with this aspect of stoic writing. Um, I think some of the most extreme cases of this is, is maybe Seneca, who kind of times seems seem almost sort of, um, and and Marcus Aurelius this. Uh, death can become almost sort of a, a sweet escape from all the, the, yeah, all the indifference in life um, because life itself is indifferent as well because we can't control whether we live or die um, fully. So in that sense, it would maybe be just really nice to get rid of this, yeah, this body that's, causing us all this pain and trouble and, and so on. Uh, I think that that's one way to go. Uh, but as Seneca and Marcus Aurelius also make very clear, that's not how nature created human beings. Uh, we have quite a strong drive towards staying alive and healthy and yeah, uh, alive and kicking, uh, so to say. And I, I think that is that is sort of the, the perspective you should take on the on the Stoic's comments on on death, that a lot of it is not meant to sort of glorify death, um, even though it can sometimes seem that way. Um, but I think that is that's very controversial in the literature. I think, but but I think it's it's fair to say that that is at least an inspiration that they're getting from the Platonists, where the, the, the ideal is more to sort of get, get out of this world. Um, and I think that the actual point of the Stoics, the Stoic comments about death is to adjust us to the thought of death. Mm -hmm. And that I think can be very helpful. Um, thinking about death more than we, we normally do in modern society, at least Western uh, societies, the societies that I uh, grew up in 
we have a tendency to to wrap away death uh, very much um you get rid of the dead body when someone in your family dies very quickly you even almost have to uh, by law and you are often not confronted with death um and it's not it's not a topic that you discuss and that for the uh, for the stoics is, is just profoundly wrong that's a really bad choice what you should do is actually think about it perpetually because that the the fear of death according to them is one of the the main reasons why we react in in non uh, moral ways um, so so we should really try to 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 address that and try to change that impression that death is something bad and so they have countless um, of these exercises that I mentioned are directed towards the goal of changing your attitude to death by mm -hmm. making you see how indifferent it actually is. Um, and I mean, again, it's, it's tough uh, and it's tough work. And the Stoics are very happy to, to acknowledge that. But I think the idea is, is actually quite appealing in a way, in a weird sort of macabre way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I like I like the the stoic take on this that it's not enough to just tell yourself that death is indifferent, but you need to really mm -hmm. confront yourself with what death death is. Um, you need to like Marcus Aurelius actually think the thought that your children might die, or that you might die before they grow up, uh, and think through the consequences. And thinking through those situations, so that's one of the, uh, the the exercises that they they uh, they um, um, what's the no word that they yeah that they tell you to to do um, is to to really visualize what it would mean for you to die or for the people you love mm -hmm. to die um, and what in that would actually be bad and their conclusion is nothing. Um, I'm not sure that many people can go with that, <laughs> but I think a lot of us can can profit from sort of mm -hmm. making making the things that we we see as horrible concrete and and through that diminishing the horror of of these phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, the next question, which is um, actually maybe more of a comment, um, it's maybe I can learn how to control how I feel, but even if I could, how does that help me? Maybe the feeling of sadness, given the suffering caused by COVID-19, is appropriate. So I would decide to be sad even if I could control my emotions. Just... Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really good comment or, <laughs> or question to a Stoic. Um, it's one of the reasons why I don't count myself a Stoic. Um, I, I actually... I think that, and that's probably just part of sort of, yeah, being, being born after romanticism. <laughs> uh, I think that, I think it contributes with something real to human, to the human experience that sometimes we suffer. Um, mm. And I, I really, I sincerely believe that, the, that as a stoic who's worth his salt, cannot acknowledge that in the end. They can acknowledge a wide range of the phenomena that we would describe as emotions, uh, such as sadness, as, as okay and rational and natural in their senses. But, but the idea that their value, that they have like real, that taking them away from your life would actually make your life worse. They cannot accept that. And I think they're wrong on that. Um, I think it's it's not so much about the sadness of the the sof of the suffering uh, caused by by for instance the, the current pandemic uh, being appropriate because they can acknowledge that, but it's more about the value for you of feeling that sadness. Uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't say that you shouldn't feel anything in the face of, of the situation. But 
they would, I think, have a difficult time given their, their other assumptions, acknowledging that what you, when you experience uh, sadness over the loss of life and livelihoods uh, caused by this pandemic, you're actually, that contributes something positive to your life. And I think it, I think it does. I think that is, that is a part of, of human mental life that, mm -hmm. that cannot be, be taken away without losing something valuable. Uh, we have um, many more questions, um, but only five minutes left. So I will now take the, the most important one. Were there stoic women philosophers? I don't actually know of any named women stoic philosophers, which is quite weird in a way, because we know that um, Cicero, who was not himself a stoic, took good care that his daughter received a very good education. Mm -hmm. And I, he seemed to have thought higher of his daughter than his son uh, in, in terms of intellectual uh, sort of uh, abilities. And they, they were adamant that women should be allowed to study philosophy. Uh, but as far as I know, they're actually, we, we, our sources don't name any Stoic uh, women uh, that have sort of um, contributed with, with at least written uh, treatises. And I don't know of, of any female, sort of, uh, prominent females, female uh, thinkers that are sort of have, are mentioned in the ancient mm -hmm. source, um, which is weird. Hence the flaws in the theory. Yeah. Okay. So next question. Um, that might be. But they I would have... say that though. <laughs> they would say that <laughs> we experience the world in basically the same way uh, as men and women. Uh, Although we are, of course, differently conditioned by our societies. Uh, the next question is um, Stoicism focuses in part on turning obstacles into opportunities through perception of situations. How would you present the current pandemic with all its struggles to date as an opportunity? I think one real opportunity that I see um, and that does tend to make me somewhat optimistic is the focus it has given many others. Um, I mean, personally, I think a lot of people have sort of, it's been a, because it's been this very weird uh, situation for many um, of those that were not most immediately hit, the, the consequences of the crisis was drawing back and staying at home. So you had a lot of time to think about a lot of things. Uh, and I think that has given focus in many people's lives, at least that's my personal experience. But also I, I do, dare to say that I'm, I'm witnessing more, um, more focus on these fundamental values in, in public uh, discussions as well. Uh, so I think the Black Lives Matters movement is a really good example of this. Of course, this has many other sort of a, a, a huge background and is not mainly due to the epidemic, but I think it's fair to say that it probably wouldn't have gained the same traction if the pandemic had not raised our uh, awareness of the inequalities suffered by people with other skin colors than white. Um, and in, in this sense, I think because the, the crisis is also a crisis of economic and social dimensions, it also gives us the chance to actually change our societies because we're about to, and pretty much all over the globe, we're about to, to pump public money into a, an attempt to sort of restart our societies economically. And it does make me a bit optimistic that at least in Europe, that's sadly the, the sort of public debate that I'm most, mm -hmm. uh, most informed about. It's actually been an issue in contrast to the prior crisis in this one, what 
is is it is it justifiable to to save certain kinds of of industry um shouldn't there be when when you're pumping public money in something shouldn't there be conditions uh, that ensure that the money that is given by the state to private corporations is actually used for the good of society in some sense um, and i think that has already had some some quite striking consequences it's not i'm not i'm not in any way all that optimistic but i think at least small changes coming and in that sense i think the the the, the crisis can actually have what i think the stoics would would recognize as a, as a very welcome um consequence namely that we're starting to to at least talk about the values instead of the immediate sort of do don't uh, but mm -hmm. consider or critically reflect of what would what what values are um are reflected in in this particular course of action and are we okay with that or do we need to do, to do something else as a society mm -hmm. okay i think we could probably go on talking for another two hours um but we have to end this here now and um, we will try to answer all the other questions in the youtube chat, la chat later on uh to thank you so much for doing this Thank talk you. it's an excellent talk fantastic discussion um and um everyone thanks for watching and please tune in next week thursday 6 p.m um we'll have ida milne here talking about the pandemic patient long-term impacts of the 1918-1919 influenza so thanks again um, thanks to all of